Hi guys, welcome to today's live stream. A little bit of a glitch there. We're trying to sort out the dropped frame. So please do let us know in today's live if we are dropping some of those frames. If you're finding that it's a little bit glitchy, we'll do all we can to get it working as good as possible. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we're gonna get into today's topic, which is constant low grade, lower back pain. Uh, the sort that you can see just over my shoulder here, we're gonna talk a little bit about this, uh, sort of why it's occurring, what to really watch out for, how to understand it a little bit better, and then more importantly, at the end, we're gonna go through what tips can you take to really get a handle on this and make sure that it gets resolved effectively because it can be quite an annoyance more than anything else. It's not necessarily the same as some of those more severe debilitating pains, but it can just great on your on your consciousness, great on your confidence when you're trying to do things. So hopefully you guys are gonna find it really, really useful. If you are new to the channel, please do consider subscribing. We do do these live streams then usually a little bit more smooth at the start and we do them every single weekday and today is no exception. We've got Q&A at the end of the live stream. So put your questions, if you've got any questions on this topic or other back related issues, post those in the comments underneath as you're watching this and we will get to those in the Q&A section. With that out of the way, let's get into today's topic on that constant low grade lower back pain. Awesome, so uh, with that first bit out of the way, let's get into today's topic. Now, low-grade lower back pain is something that really does uh, get in the way of people's sort of enjoyment of life. And it's something that unfortunately, it's very difficult to see from the outside. So people don't necessarily uh, understand what you're going through because you can essentially do everything. It's just there's this, this, this stuff in the background that's really bothering you. So normally we're talking about that sort of strap-like pain across the lower back. Now it can be, yes, more on one side than the other. And we've got the sort of the region of the spine that we're talking about on the board here, sort of that L4, L5, S1 region. And it can kind of just, it's just a strap basically across that lower back. Now it could be just on the one side, it could be on the other, but in, invariably it is gonna affect the whole thing. And it's just there. It's commonly there a little bit more in the morning when you wake up, get out of bed, it's stiff, it's achy, it's uncomfortable. And that's really the sort of the main pain that we're talking about here. It's not to the point where we can't move or we, we, we we're unable, we've got raging muscle spasm or anything like that, but it is there. And sometimes these chronic pains can really bother people just as much as some of the other ones. For example, we have tinnitus, which is sort of the noise in your ear. And, and if it was there for a moment, it may not might not bother you, but when it's constantly there, it can really, really be something that gets you down emotionally and mentally as well. So it doesn't necessarily stop you doing anything that you want to do, uh, but it can go as well from time to time. So this can fluctuate from that aching and then maybe once or twice a year or once or twice a quarter, we might get this sort of sciatica associated with that flare up, we've pushed it a little bit too far. So it can be, it can be a little bit worse, but this is almost a status quo and it's not really necessary, it really isn't. And I would say that this is quite often the case that lower back pain will begin like this starts off as an ache across the lower back and we've mentioned this in previous live streams in terms of that ache is often misdiagnosed as a muscle spasm you'll see it just down over my left shoulder here a little comment referencing that and we'll talk about that more a little bit later on but it, it often begins as this and unfortunately people tend to ignore this in the early days now we go through a relapse or a flare-up or something that, that with symptoms worsening and then we get treatment maybe, but we don't necessarily do all the rehab that's designed or supposed to be done. And when then we're left, we come back down to this low grade ache. And a lot of people will just get on and, and, and kind of try and ignore it. But it's almost at the start of a back issue and at the end of a back issue. Back issue. And what we're trying to help you guys to do in today's live stream is understand it a little bit more, which is all the stuff in the red, which I'll talk about. But then more importantly, realize that you know, if it started out and you haven't had the severe flare up uh, yet ever, then let's deal with it properly. Let's recognize what it actually is and it's not a muscle spasm. Or maybe you've been through the, uh, the sort of the increase in severity of symptoms and you've come back down to this sort of resting level of just general discomfort in that lower back. And, and maybe we can give you guys some solutions to actually fix that a little bit more effectively so it's not something that's day in, day out and gradually peters off because that would be, I imagine for many of you, really, really helpful. Now, the one thing I wanna make you guys aware of is the very first thing to get your head around is that discs, we are not very aware of our discs. There's something called the somatosensory cortex, which is basically our brain's representation of our body. And our face and our hands take up an inordinate amount of space. They really are the majority. 
our brain has very clear two point discrimination here. We know exactly which centimeter square or millimeter or even smaller than that is actually the bit that's causing us pain. So when we hurt our hand, we know it's this, let's call it a millimeter square, just for reference here. But when we have an injury going on on our lower back, even a minor one, you know, you nick your finger, it's not a severe injury, but it may hurt quite a lot, it's that small area. But when something's going wrong inside us, in our discs maybe, for example, it's like saying, hey, there's something wrong in that football pitch over there, try and figure out where it is. And that's why we get that broad ache. The reality is the whole thing isn't damaged. It's probably a very, very small part of that. Maybe it's a minor disc strain, some annular, annular, annular uh, tearing, or maybe it's a little bit of a bulge. Maybe we've strained the facet joint, very, very small area of actual injury. But because the brain doesn't have a clear idea of that area, because it normally shouldn't need to, we don't really know where it is. And that's what can lead us that, to that initial uh, sort of band-like lower back pain that is just uncomfortable or an ache or a nuisance to start with. So that's one very important thing. We don't know exactly what's going on in there in our brain because we're not designed to know. Now, it might be that there's slight damage with insufficient healing. So it could be the slight damage in the first instance, maybe we've, we've overstrained it through repetitive strain at work, or it might be that we've overstrained it, we've had a more severe injury, but it hasn't healed properly. And we talk about this a lot with exercises that you should not do, things like knee hugs and those sorts of things, which actually impair, in our experience, impair the healing process. They stop those tissues from knitting back together and forming a strong structure, because every single day, multiple times a day, you're pulling those structures apart and stretching them out even more, because we've had that initial misdiagnosis of a muscle spasm, which fundamentally doesn't make sense. So that's really, really important. Or unfortunately, and this is gonna throw a lot of you guys, because it goes counter to what I've said so far, it could be a more severe issue. We've had patients that come into the clinic um, with, with a minor backache. Oh, I've just got this constant backache, it bothers me. In one case, there stand out in, in my mind uh, from a good, good few years ago. It just bothers me, it's uncomfortable. And actually there's something a little bit more sinister going on down there there's a little bit more uh, severe uh, structural damage down there that we maybe maybe would care to uh, well would, would like to see but unfortunately when you see that on an image you, you have to then talk about it so it can be sometimes that these situations are a little bit more severe and they actually should be investigated looked into properly to formulate a accurate diagnosis as to what exactly is damaged and injured and then how we can proceed to go forward to, to, to resolve those issues. So it can unfortunately sometimes be more severe and, and think about other, other situations, other injuries. This is a little bit tangential, but issues that affect this zone here can quite often not be um, outwardly perceived as specific locations of pain until they move quite far on in terms of the, de the, de the degenerative or degrading process in terms of injury or disease. We don't need to know what's going on in this bucket, in this box here on a regular basis because it's not normally interacting with the out uh, external environment. So we don't have good awareness of what's going on. And quite often the first thing that does show up is an aching or muscle spasm. Now I've put here, it's not muscle spasm. Muscle spasm is never the cause. We have quite often people commenting or people asking questions or we're getting MRIs back and, and it might say, oh, there's, there's this, 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 and this, uh, some minor muscle spasm, or the GP will say, or the other practitioners say, oh yeah, the muscles are just tight. Well, of course the muscles are tight. If there's an injury there, you tighten up too. If you sprain your ankle, if you break your ankle, you recoil and you try and tense up, you try and avoid and take pressure off that structure and your muscles go into a degree of spasm because something has failed, which sets off alarm bells. You could say if the fire alarm went off in your office place, there would be a certain degree of spasm amongst the community. The community would be maybe be going a little bit crazy crazy and running around. Those muscles, those individual people might be running around, but they are not the problem. There's a fire over here that set off the bell that is causing the people spasm. And think of your muscles in a similar way. They are not necessarily the problem. They may be reacting and then quite often they are the first responders. They're the first things to act in the case of lower back pain because they get that signal first before your brain necessarily feels pain per se. So it's important to have that in your mind when we're thinking about this low grade lower back pain because if we think that it's muscle spasm, we'll try and stretch those muscles out to alleviate the spasm and, and, and open them out. The problem with that is that the actions of doing that can often make things worse. And we see this, the, the knee hug example as a, as a shining light as to why we shouldn't necessarily uh, be treating muscle spasm first because it makes the underlying problems worse. Now, 
we want to be practical with today's live stream and give you guys some some step-by-step -step evaluation points so i'm going to go through that now and and hopefully you guys are going to find it really useful and maybe use this to reflect on your own sort of aching lower back pain some of you will have the information you'll have the mri the x-ray you know exactly what's going on but for those of you that have maybe come across this video who've got that aching in the lower back and you're not really sure why then this will be a good evaluation point to start with so the first thing is have an honest and this is the first thing it's not you don't jump down to number three we, we do this in order all too often people skip ahead say that doesn't apply to me and skip ahead when actually it does and more times than i care to repeat that is the case so i will stress that if we do it properly we figure out what's going on have an honest evaluation of our daily activities and our physical conditions are we sitting for extended periods of time of the 24 hours in the day of which maybe eight we sleep of those remaining 16 how much are we actually doing physical exercise not going for a walk physical exercise to stimulate our body and work properly do we have excess weight and quite often and i've heard this in the clinic before people say well i had I, I, i've been overweight for six years for 10 years for 20 years my back's only started hurting now my weight's not a problem well yes your weight is a problem because it's a barrier to recovery and if we're constantly chipping away for example if we've got a tree and we're trying to cut a tree down we can hit the tree once and make a dent that's not necessarily going to cause the tree to fall over but if we hit the tree enough times eventually it will fall over and it might be that last one we use a little hammer but the previous ones we've been using an axe and we say well the hammer knocked the tree down no it didn't the axe hammering away at the structure of that tree for years or months or weeks or days on end and then that little, tiny little hammer was the last one to make it go if we can stop doing all those things if we can remove some of the excess weight if we can be a little bit more active if we can take time to evaluate our physical performance our physical conditioning and make improvements there or at least recognize that there are improvements that can be made we all of a sudden put ourselves in a very very strong position all too often people view those situations maybe excess weight difficulty with the lifestyle fitting in some of these things uh, lack of physical conditioning diet changes etc they view those all as bad things but actually if you say well these are all not very good you have four things there that you are 100% in control of and can make the change. You can adjust your physical fitness, you can adjust your BMI, you can adjust your daily habits. And many of the guys in the back in shape watching this, you guys have things like sit and stand desks or you're adjusting the way in which we're working or we're adjusting the way in which we're doing things on a daily basis. And that is very, very empowering. Knowing that we can control those things is really, really important because it gives us a way out. It gives us a way to solve this situation. And unfortunately with some of this chronic low grade back pain it can sometimes be that it's been there for many years so doing things for a week or two is not going to be sufficient to actually make the long-term change but if we can stay the course we will do very very well so that's the first one it's just having an honest reflection of the condition of everything that's inside your control the next thing is begin with relief try those sensible relief based protocols that we put in phase one the phase one of the back in shape things like making your hamstrings, your hip flexors, and your glutes a little bit more mobile so the hips can work better. Having a bit of an understanding about how your spine works so you can not put excess stress on it. We shouldn't see anyone in the phase two or phase three of the back in shape routine, or even really phase one after a week, doing anything that involves forward bending. We shouldn't be doing forward bending stretches. We shouldn't be doing knee hugs. We shouldn't be slouching in the chairs. All those things should have been eliminated by that education that goes alongside phase one. So if you're in the latter stages and we're struggling a little bit, take a look at those things and make sure we're not making those simple mistakes still, because those hold you back. And I've mentioned this before, we can do a lot of good things, but if we're doing one or two of the wrong things, they can throw the whole thing off course. So please bear that in mind and, and, and ask questions. And, and that way we can guide you guys a little bit better as well. And then finally, or second second to last, we want to explore those strength-based physical uh, sort of physical activities, improving our strength and stability. And that's where we put it in phase two and phase three. And you'll note this is before the fourth and final point. We want to improve the strength and stability in the structure because most, the overwhelming majority of cases like this, the strength and stability is lacking. We may have, in the case of some of the guys and some of the ladies, we may have strong leg muscles, we may have strong upper body, we may be lifting weights in the gym, but there are some things that fall apart in terms of our core stability and the way in which we move. We maybe aren't moving correctly. And that is reveals itself in things like one of the hip hinge exercises, which you may think are very, very strong, but then you can't do a hip hinge which means that you're very, very strong lifting very, very heavy weights incorrectly and making your back worse whilst feeling that you are actually strong. There's just some technique pointers that if we can just turn the dial there here and turn a dial there and turn that down, we can really make some drastic improvement in the overall success of our rehab process. So that's important. Again, 
not just the exercises, but the understanding of the exercises. And it's really not that simple. All too often medical terms and medical things in general are made to be a little bit more complex than they actually are in reality. And part of that may be by design and part of it may be by accident, but it's not necessarily as complex as people try and make it out to be um, on the practitioner side. And then the final one is adding flexibility. Some of you guys do not have enough flexibility in certain ranges and we've got to improve that. But the flexibility program, for example, will tell you why and when you should be doing it and why and when you shouldn't be doing it. And if you're in phase one, we should not be doing those sorts of things. We focus on phase two, phase three. Remember, I said in order. If we do these things in order, we're going to do well. If we don't do them in order and don't do them correctly, then we're going to struggle. But if you go through that process, take accountability for some of those things that you can change in your day-to-day -day life, physical conditioning, etc. And by the way, we're coming, coming close to wrapping this up. So if you guys have any questions, do post those in the comments below. Take control of those things we can control. BMI, physical activity, lifestyle, the things we're doing on a daily basis, the ways we're using our body. Attempt some phase one exercises, some relief-based exercises. They're going to provide a little bit of protection for the back. They're going to support it a little bit and provide that respite. For example, yesterday on the live stream talking about running, the towel in the ice is a great habit that we can use after a run to really relieve some of those structures that have been under strain. But we can also use that after sitting at the desk for extended periods. We can break those periods up by using the towel. And then we've got phase two and phase three, which are really, you've just got to get on and do it. We've got to move from phase two to the end of phase three. And there's no shortcuts in between we do things properly otherwise we we don't do well uh, we do things properly and we do some consistently over that time frame and really there is no period that we need to wait from phase one to phase two because you're not going to improve your fitness or your strength or your stability in phase one the only thing you do is you move into phase two and you get started with that and move on that is really those exercises when done correctly are safe for everybody so if you're struggling you feel like you're not fit enough to do them and do them anyway and do what you can and do them safely and maybe you're only doing one or two reps i know a few other guys that have already been through the back and shape process really really struggled with some of those exercises but they didn't say i'm going to stop and i'm going to wait till i get fitter because somehow you're going to get fitter by doing nothing it doesn't work like that we have to slowly go through and sorry for being a bit direct but that is the fact of the matter and unfortunately we regularly get people that say i'm not i'm not going to go on to that because i'm not ready yet and, we, and then it's a case of, well, how, how do you suppose you're going to get ready? By emptying the dishwasher every day? It's not going to work. So go through those safe exercises sensibly over the time frame and finally finish up by adding a little bit of flexibility in alongside those phase three routines. And that way, as our strength is really building nicely, our stability, our control is really building nicely and our movement patterns are good, we can improve a little bit of range of motion to make ourselves even more protected. And that is pretty much it from me. Q&A? Q&A. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Yes, please do continue popping your questions in the comments below. I had a very quick question. We're talking today about constant low-grade yep. uh, low back pain. Yep. Um, what if, w would the same advice apply if somebody just has a, you know, a, an episode of back pain? Maybe they're sit sitting in the car and they're like, oh, that actually really, really hurts. But then when they walk it off, they walk it off and they're fine. Would the same advice apply to someone who's got sporadic Okay. Yeah, because because what's happening is something about that sitting in the car is aggravating a structure that is weaker than it otherwise should be. Your whole body doesn't hurt when you sit down. You know, it, 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 it's the action of sitting in the car is highlighting that, hey, there's some structure down here that's not doing its fair share, that it's being exploited by this particular position. And that may be because of that particular activity. Maybe you have to drive for work and you're driving every day for long periods. Or maybe it's something else and it's just that driving happens to exploit that particular weakness. But it's something to bear in mind that's a red flag or a warning sign for you, not a medical emergency red flag, but a, a warning sign for you to say, hey, there's something not right here. We need to move into some of these other exercises. And it's worth mentioning that this chronic low grade lower back pain, it, it doesn't necessarily happen to everyone, but a lot of people that ha go through the phase of back pain when it's very, very severe will then move back down to a, a point where it is a little bit more chronic and it's low grade, but it's maybe there a little bit more frequently. And that is just a necessary part of going through the healing process. As information calms down, it's not quite so pointed. It's not quite so noticeable from a point of view of sharp pain, very severe pain. I can't move pain. But then as it settles down, it's still there a little bit. It's like turning the volume down. It, you know, if it's very, very loud, we can't hear. Good, goodness me. But as we turn it down, we can still hear it in the background until it goes all the way off. And that sometimes cleaning up that last bit of problem can really take a little bit longer because that's the tissues remodeling, that's the tissues re-strengthening and rebuilding. Uh, and, and obviously, as we've mentioned before, the collagen and the, and the ligamentous tissue and the tendinous tissue, those tissues do take a little bit longer than the muscles to, to, to adapt. 
Okay, brilliant. So a couple of questions coming through. Ollie has asked here, what is happening when we crack our back or getting it cracked? Is it helpful? Um, I would ask the question back, is it helpful for you? Um, generally speaking, with those manipulation-based techniques, they are releasing little nitrogen bubbles. You get a little bit of a dopamine release, which is nice, and they are, when they're done properly, they're releasing certain uh, certain joints that are maybe a little bit more stiff and, and, and not working as well as they should do. But we're not putting anything back. People often have the misunderstanding because this is where uh, the difficulty with explaining from the practitioner's point of view to to the patient in a in a way that can be understood it, it sounds better if you say i put the joint back or i put your neck back or i've done this no nothing's been put back anywhere in order to in order to put something back we have to first identify where it was we can't just say a very a very uh, vague out it's out when we do analysis and we look at the spine we say it's out this way by this many percentage points and now we're going to move it back over a period of time when those joints are not moving it's more a case of it's stiff and it's stuck. The joints are just not working as well as they should be and we're releasing them and getting them working again. That is really a more accurate representation of that. And yes, it's helpful, but sometimes those joints are stiff maybe because there's extra load on them and they're going to keep stiffening up. They're going to keep loading up maybe because of your lifestyle. Maybe you are someone, maybe you're a dentist, let's suppose, and you're leaning into people's mouths every day. Maybe not the best choice at the moment given everything that's going on, but it's a, it's a good example and you're leaning over into people's mouths every day well your neck's going to stiffen up because of what you have to do so releasing some of those joints can be helpful doing maintenance exercises to combat that can be helpful especially if you're spending 50 percent of your day for eight hours or four hours a day in that position there's no two ways about it having an mot there is going to be helpful if you regularly or if your child maybe is regularly skidding with their bike you are going to regularly have to replace the back tire or replace the punches that happen there's no, you could say, we'll stop doing that, but sometimes that's not practical. Maybe they really like to skid around corners. So you're gonna to have to just keep replacing the tire to keep the, to keep the bike in good nick. And the same thing here. Some of those manipulations, they can, they can be helpful in maintaining things. That being said, it is always better to try and adjust things where possible and improve strength. It, should, it shouldn't be a replacement for sensible rehabilitation exercises because that leads you down to dependence and it is not good. And in my opinion, it's a very lazy way of operating and you shouldn't encourage patients to want to operate in that manner. Uh, you make them aware and say, hey, look, I'm only helping put a Band-Aid on this thing. You're actually going to have to do some rehab. And sometimes patients will come and say, I don't want to do any rehab. I'm not doing it. Don't, don't want to. And I've had patients flat out refuse on the first consultation. I am not doing exercises at home if you tell me to. And, and that's a very awkward conversation. <laughs> but some people need that and some people want that approach. I would really encourage you, though, please don't let that be you. Okay, awesome. Sally's asking about the phase three here. She says, I'm in phase three, happy with the repetition and progress being made. Good work. The alternative phase three program, is that working the same areas, um, just using different exercises to introduce variety, or is there a benefit to using both? Or is it okay to stick to one? Yeah, so uh, with with the phase two, sorry, the phase three, workout one and workout two, they are actually challenging different things. The, the only, well, you'll notice this, and, and some of the other guys that have tried this, um the, the new phase two workout well, sorry the, the, the phase three there are two workouts there's workout one which you which is sally you're doing at the moment and then there's workout two which we released a little bit afterwards it is challenging the same areas but in different ways uh particularly the hip hinge is a really good one i, I do really like you're going to find it's going to work your body in different ways you'll probably get a little bit of doms when you try it i know one of the other ladies in the in the group uh, moving up to phase three maybe you've got this as well sally moving up to phase three you've got a bit of doms everywhere from from upping that intensity i wouldn't be surprised if you trying that routine you start to feel it in different ways and really the the idea is once you're competent with with the first workout in phase three that you then um, look to add in the second workout in phase three and long term we may be doing uh, one or two days a week of that one and one or two days a week of the other one and then obviously we've got the flexibility program to add in but for the time being you know you might be doing or you should be doing more workouts a week so you're doing them sort of maybe three or four days of one workout and, and three and two or three days of the other workout that helps yeah any questions awesome. just post them in the comments afterwards uh, sally okay, or, or now so i can answer um alex vesco has said here uh, phase one two and now phase three has completely resolved my chronic muscle spasm stiff back ache. that's awesome um i've had an achy back for years and years but now um no ache really for nearly a year which is fantastic um if only i could get the same sciatica fixed when my surgery comes up thank you me clinic yeah, I'd, I'd say, Alex, just keep working on the strengthening, keep making improvements. 
and also look to the flexibility program uh, tentatively and see how you get on with that because it may be that that helps just decrease some of the stress remember only through those hips but as your as your muscles are getting stronger and your hips are getting stronger they're going to compensate a little bit better for that lower back awesome Jeannie here said thanks so much for covering this issue i've had this for over seven years awesome. i thought i was the only person experiencing this uh, it makes sense and now i'm reviewing how i can better help myself yeah guys the topics that we talk about this back pain i think that's the biggest thing and i mentioned it from the outset of, on today's live stream just saying you know um people quite often especially with this before maybe it's severe sciatica and we can't move people will often you know just bottle it up and think i'm the only one that's going through this and you're, you're standing in the room thinking thinking that and everyone else is probably in that room or you know 50 percent of the room is also thinking similar things uh, and that's the big problem with back pain it's not like you've got a big rash on your face or a big sign on your forehead that says hey look at me i've got this issue and it's similar to other mental health issues like depression people don't know you've got it so you can feel very isolated and alone which doesn't help the situation but i would stress that you know things like the back in shape especially the facebook group you can actually see that it's not just you it, it, it's lots of people it's very common things that people struggle with and you know there are ways we can get past that and also seeing that other people struggle with it but have managed to overcome it by doing certain things can also give you the, the sort of the positive prospects of doing the same so um, you're not alone there's lots of people that have this sort of issue that that just kind of have to try and deal with it on their own yeah. and feel you know not very good yeah that's a great comment um joe's asked here um what happens beyond phase three so is there a point where you finish phase three and where do you go from there so to be honest, yeah, that's something that we really are um, are looking to add in. But really, the phase three routine is a routine that you can go through sort of for life. It's it's a efficient, especially if you're interspersing the two phase three routines uh, with the flexibility program or, or without the flexibility program. We'd also always suggest that you guys go you go from phase one to phase two to phase three. You add in the second workout in phase three, and once you're stable there, you're like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm doing five sets of ten. Let's go and explore the flexibility program being added in. We do that for the duration of the program alongside phase three. I didn't say instead of, I said add it in. And then once you come out the other side of the flexibility program, we really do have a good structured, you're definitely gonna have the habit there. You, you'll have formed a habit by then, that's for sure. But you're definitely gonna have the structure, the structure that you need to just continue doing these exercises for the long term. They take around about half an hour, maybe a little bit less. And doing that three, four, five times a week, you don't necessarily even need to do it. You may enjoy it. I know many of you guys do really enjoy doing it. Um, on a daily basis but you don't need to once you get to that point you're able to maybe do three four days a week and, and if you go out and you have a nice day out wherever or you go on holiday or wherever it may be for a little break for a few days then it's not the end of the world if we have a few days off sometimes recovery in that stage or having rest days or as we've said said before adaptation days can actually be really useful but i would con i would stress that using the bands that's why they're such a, a cool tool because whether the gyms are closed because of what's going on at the moment or whether they're open you can still get a really good workout at home uh, that's going to keep you keep you healthy and a lot of guys that are in the back in shape they're not necessarily gym goers it's not like you you, you enjoy going to the gym and you actively go to the gym under normal circumstances but this routine can be short sharp efficient get the job done no faff and then we can get on and enjoy the rest of our day 30 minutes out of eight hours uh sorry out of 16 hours that we're awake is not a big ask um so yeah okay brilliant um veronica has left a really good comment here she said for the first time ever uh i've taken my time probably because i was in too much pain to jump ahead i've listened to my body and moved slowly through the phases by recording all of my times and not moving ahead until i actually saw progress I found that I've gained so much by doing this. Such a good comment. Yeah, I think I think the frustration of wanting to get out and get back to the things we want to do is often what what encourages us to cut corners and do those sorts of things. But it doesn't work like that. The body will not allow you to get get away with that for the long term. And I think that's a really good good comment there that that really shows what diligent attention can do. And it doesn't need to be overbearing either. Um, you know. We, we could have said, for example, spend three hours a day doing this, that and the other and four hours doing that and two hours doing this. And it's just not realistic. But the, the reality is with a re relatively uh, small period of time each day, working on these things can really make a profound difference when we add it up over the course of two, three, four weeks, two, three, four months and longer. OK, two really good comments here. We'll do Kate's and then go, go, go through to Sally. So Kate said, since starting on the phase three, uh, certainly get more lower back pain after doing it presumably highlighting need for more strengthening yeah 
Um, so just, just on a quick side note before I get into that, please do let us know in the comments, guys, those of you that have joined us over the last two or three days, let us know in the comments about uh, the quality. Is is the stream working a little bit better today? That would be really interesting from a feedback point of view. I think on Facebook it's okay, but okay. I think on YouTube, we're a couple of seconds behind the audio okay. ahead of the, the, the picture. Okay. So sorry awesome. about that, guys. Okay, so on the topic of that question, Kate, it, it's actually really, really common. And, and this is, you're at the point where we can maybe allow a little bit of irritation. The real question we need to ask ourselves is are we a bit uncomfortable have we got a bit of a back pump uh in the in the lower back and, and sometimes that is what what we're feeling uh during or just immediately after the workout but if we go and do the towel the icing and the stretching and that stuff 30 40 50 minutes to an hour after we finish the routine is that still there if it is back off a little bit but if it's something that really is subsiding and not not increasing over success, uh, consecutive days then i'd say don't worry about it too much you'll find that actually as your body starts to strengthen up because that phase three routine is a big step up i know one of the other ladies was <laughs> noticed the big step up as well as i've mentioned and a lot of people will notice the step up even inside going from one routine to the next and it's going to put more strain uh, more challenging uh, through those structures that are load bearing and the muscles and the spine and it's going to really challenge those a little bit and we can get a little bit of an irritation there but also some of those exercises require a little bit more of a back and muscle involvement than we've had in phase uh, in phase two. The phase three exercises are really starting to work some of those larger lat muscles, some of the multifidus muscles, they're starting to work the hip muscles in a bigger way uh, and, and the core muscles as well. And all of that is gonna give a feeling of tightness or aching because those muscles are literally tightening up while you're doing the workout. So sometimes we don't want, we don't want to, um, misattribute that, that sensation as being necessarily something bad it is something that's relatively normal when we're going through a new intensity workout and i would say that the phase three is a, is a big step up from phase two especially if we've not done anything like it before okay awesome um thanks uh sarah and she just said it's better than yesterday yesterday i couldn't watch the live at all oh no but i'm glad it's better today we good. are trying to good. work on the, on the on the things on the back end um oh, good Okay, uh, so Sally's comment, she said, thanks, I've been a bit wary of trying the second phase, yep. the, the second exercise in phase three, uh, having increased overnight pain, although doing okay with phase three. Um, having my imaging soon, so hopefully um, yes. you can get yes, further yes. advice on that. I'm happy to have the safe exercises to do, even though I'm, I've still got a little bit of discomfort. A few hours later, getting stronger feels good and motivational. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, some of those phase uh, phase three workout two exercises are going to be a little bit of a challenge because they really, uh, if you don't move properly on them, if we don't really get it right, you're going to get a bit of discomfort. But I will say at the same time, in the same breath, ones like the hip hinge and that particular superset where we're doing that, um, go and check this out afterwards. Just maybe even to watch the videos, you are going to get a back pump. The muscles in that lower back are going to, are going to, are going to really, you know, get blood going into them. They're going to get engaged and they're going to get stimulated. And you will feel this kind of like just achiness in that lower back in the muscles, kind of like a patch around a little bit higher than this, just up here sort of thing, uh, through that whole region after you've finished. And that's the muscles engaging. You will notice that and you tr like a cramping in the muscles almost. Um, and that's okay. It will get easier, but it'll always be there when we're doing that workout. The same way if we were to, and it may not be the most applicable variation, but if we're doing bicep curls, and we're doing a lot of them, it feels like this thing is really, really kind of tense and seizing up because you're seizing it up. So it's just a case of treading that fine line between doing too much and doing enough to get a bit of a reaction because we need a reaction in phase three from those muscles. They do need to work. Yeah. Um, Alex Casper said, I'm going to keep doing the phases for my life now, my new yoga. Yay! Yeah, um, I mean, that's what, they're, that's what they're designed for. We wanted to give you guys a workout that actually is challenging, is robust, is, is, is ticking all the boxes. Um, and, and, and why stop? You know, we don't, we don't stop, our, stop cleaning our teeth after we've been to the dentist. You know, oh, I've, I've done that. They're clean. You know, we keep <laughs> doing it. And I would suggest you do the same. Okay, uh, Kate said, really great topic today. Thanks so much. I'm just going to jump over to YouTube. Uh, Margaret has said here, I have taken the not uh, bending forward literally and avoid, avoid at all costs and so find general day-to-day -day tasks difficult, e.g. putting on socks. Am I being too strict? Am I think overthinking everything? Thanks. I think, I think in the early days, no, you're doing the right thing. Uh, but what you are going to find is we then have the, and maybe take a look at this, it's a bit premature maybe for you, but take a look at the, um, the, the hip hinge exercise because that is a forward bend, but it's a forward bend from the hips. 
And as we get better, as we go through, you are gonna incorporate forward bending in the future. Remember our spine does forward bend, but we need to feed it in a little bit later on. And the hip hinge is not even feeding in forward bending of the spine, but just general forward bending of the upper body. We pivot here. If I show you guys on the little model here, forward bending would be, or flexion of the lumbar spine would be that. Uh, but when we're doing the hip hinge, we are doing that. And that's very different. And I think that's gonna be something that's okay. We can feed that in. You're gonna feel a bit of tension come through here to a certain degree, but that is gonna be okay sooner than that. And I would really say, I wouldn't do that because that is not sensible, it's not safe. We want to get down into a nice position like so by using our hips. Remember those phase one principles, the hips are there to support the spine and hold it in a good position. The problem is that when we don't have good mobile hips and weak muscles in this region, we end up doing that too much as we bend down. So you're doing the right thing, avoiding the forward flexion for the time being. Potentially, we can look at actually moving a little bit more like this. So if you are gonna put your socks on, pivot from your bum, pivot from the hips, so we're moving like that. And then later on, we can be a little bit less cautious about those sorts of things. But there's no circumstances at all when anyone should be bending from their back to lift mm. a heavy box. Uh, it's just not necessary. And we shouldn't really be doing the same thing when we're going down to do some gardening. Maybe you're doing some weeding. weeding. You know, just because you can bend down and do that stuff like that, you shouldn't do that. It, for two reasons. Number one, it's not good for your back. But also, we need to move our hips, knees and ankles through a complete range of motion on a daily basis. And if you kneel down, you might say, well, my knees are bad. Well, if your knees wouldn't be bad if we'd done it 20, 30 years ago, we were regularly moving through four ranges of motion, but people get lazy, they just bend down to do it. But actually you should go down and take a knee or get down on the ground and actually do that. And that moves your hip through a nice full range, keeps all those cartilage, all the cartilage there healthy. It moves your knee through a nice full range, again, keeping the cartilage healthy, keeping the muscles supple, and also moves your ankle through a nice full range. And you can see how if we stop doing that, 10, 15, five years ago, then we all of a sudden start using our back more out of what we would say essentially laziness. If we can start building up problems in both movement patterns, the way our brain tells our body to move, but also in the structures themselves. So um, do try and get down on one knee if we're doing certain things, keep the back supported and use those flexible hips to do most of the work. So am I right in thinking if Margaret is in sort of the phase one, early phase two, she's doing the right thing, Correct. avoiding. Correct. But as you move through the program and your body's strengthened, you can't get away with it. Yeah. And, and also you will need to start to learn to do the hip hinge. Yeah. Because there's nothing wrong with doing hip hinge. That's okay. perfectly fine. But often we find that we can't do it without flexing our lumbar spine, rounding our back. And uh, maybe maybe the hip, maybe we could talk about that in more detail on a, on a, on a clinic live stream when we're in the clinic. Uh, let us know in the comments guys if you'd find it helpful for us to just talk a little bit about the sort of what we mean when we talk about flexing and rounding the lower back maybe we do it in the clinic uh clinic uh, on one of the one of the mornings we're there uh that might be might be good okay awesome i think that is everything for today that was brilliant so many comments and questions thank you awesome. so much guys did you just want to tell everybody yeah about... i totally forgot about yeah, that okay yeah because of the start <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to organize the uh, and stop dropping frames. It looks like we've only dropped 0.8%. So it seems like whatever we did yesterday after the live stream is working. Now, uh, yes, the thing we wanted to let you guys know, it's, it's we'll have more details on this on over the coming uh, weeks or so, but we have been working to revamp the entire Back in Shape website. Uh, so the whole thing, the membership site, the store, the, the information, all of it, is being revamped over whilst well, we started a couple of weeks ago and hopefully over the next three four five six weeks we're going to have some more details and hopefully have it running live in that sort of time frame so do stay tuned really excited about it it's yeah. it's going to be uh, even better than it already is yes so. it'll make it easier to navigate around it'll yep. be smoother slicker so we're really excited to launch yes. that for you guys so, soon yes very very soon but do stay uh, stay tuned because we will be letting you guys know in the premium membership area on facebook um, and via email about more details on that for the premium members in particular sooner rather than later. So, that's that everything? It. That's awesome. It for today. Well, <laughs> lovely way to end. Yeah. A little bit more organized than the start. So, thanks so much for <laughs> joining with uh, joining us, guys, and bearing with us at the start of today's live stream. It's been really appreciated, and the questions, as always, are on point, are, are really, really good and helpful for both us to enjoy the live stream more, you to get more value out of it, and hopefully the other watchers that, that are maybe joining us for the first time get some extra information as well. So, thank you so much. We will be joining you guys tomorrow from the clinic uh, tomorrow on tomorrow's live stream. So, look forward to seeing you then. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow with the other live stream. Bye now.
thanks so much for joining us on today's video. Hopefully you found it packed full of useful information. If you wanna learn more about the premium Back in Shape membership, there's gonna be a video somewhere underneath here. And if you wanna stay up to date or tune in to some of our more recent live streams and the Q and A's at the end of those, then that's gonna be down here. And remember, you can subscribe to the channel up here and hit the notification bell to make sure you know when we next go live so you can join us for our next live stream and Q and A.